Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mom Looks. I'm Mahin and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Sheikh Hamir Saeed and Sim. On today's show, I'd like to welcome an old friend, Sheikh Abdurrahman Chow, who is a graduate of the Islamic University of Medina, and he also has a master's degree in Christian theology from Vanderbilt University, but somehow decided to settle down doing IT like every other brown guy in America, even though he's not brown, working for an oil and gas company, making that big bunny, sold out. Unlike most of other people, but it's all good. But Sheikh Abdurrahman and I have a unique history going back about 10 years because I want to say in 2006, 2007, you had just graduated from the University of Medina mm-hmm. and you were at TDC and you gave this some, at the time, a very epic talk. I don't know how epic it was. I never heard it, but this controversial talk on masturbation. Sure. And back then it was like, yo, who's talking about masturbation at an Islamic conference? That's crazy. Even though I'm sure that's something the ulama have dealt with. For like centuries, right? Yeah. You know? And so I Facebook friend him and he's like, yeah, I don't know you. So I don't really accept friend requests from people I don't know. I'm like, ah, cool. Thank you. I like that you did that. I I, I, I can respect that. So then he comes through to like Chicago like a few years later and we just chill for like a week. We get like churros and frozen custard and like just hang out. Yeah. What's with this whole thing about churros addiction that you and Maheen have? It's not churros addiction really. Or Maheen has it, but he converted you. I mean. That's the only time in my life I've had. That's the only time in my life I had churros. Oh, is that what that was? Yeah, so like then we reconnected again a couple like a couple months ago after our podcast uh, kind of made some waves and we talked about some stuff. So glad to have you here in in, in Chicago. Welcome hey, back, man. Thanks. Yeah, man. It's thanks good to me. meet you too, man. Appreciate you, man. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> funny story. We were uh, at the at the booth getting ready. we so we're actually like, recording at it's the 2017, and we were at our booth, and he's just sitting there waiting no, for us to my, pack don't, up. No, please. Let's, let's you not know? talk about this. Dude. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, you know, no. some people are coming. No. By. No, sorry. No, I apologize ahead of time. You know, <laughs> my bad, dude. My bad, dude. No, because <laughs> if, if, if you guys see Chow in person, you, I'm going to call him Chow. Just like, you know, that's how informal we are. If you see Chow in person, you're not, you'll are not. you just think he's some random Asian dude. Right. So, he just, he just sitting in our booth hanging out, waiting for us to like get ready to pack up and leave. And there are people coming through and, you know, they ask like, who, yeah, who's that guy? Like, yeah, you know, this guy's, you know, thinking about converting to Islam. You know, but the problem is he's like, he's Asian and he loves that pork, man. He's like, there's no meal without pork. Right. For Asian folks. <laughs> the other white meat. Right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like that dim sum or whatever. Sorry, bro. Sorry. You know? Pork dim sum, you know? Yeah, pork dim sum. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. And then he's like, uh, and then finally, the second, first person just walked away. She just believed it. Walked away. And he like shakes his head. He looks at me like, yeah, she probably bought it too. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He definitely bought it. Yeah. Second person came through, but him, I, I, he's a friend of mine. And I was like, I let it sink in like five minutes later before he was like yo that's not true he's actually uh was it the youngest graduate well, of the university of medina or that's what they say and the, 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 i guess the record broke <laughs> like really fast after that <laughs> <laughs> they like lowered the admissions qualifications or something l- l- letting kids from like elementary school <laughs> who knows but uh before we i want to get to that your, your background as a as an asian american muslim yeah you know <sighs> Is that a joke like that? Like I was gonna, I would ask you. A normal person would ask you. I, sh- I apologize for offending you. Me, I really don't care. Um, <laughs> so I didn't say that. But like you know, it is what it is. Sure, it, it's come to the territory. You're within my vicinity. You know, I just talk like that. Sure, but like, do you get that a lot? As far as you know, people are. Are you a convert or? But your family goes back how long into Islam? So. Um- I guess I'll start off with a story. So I was, so I'm, I'm, I'm based down in Houston. Um, I was at a masjid one time and uh, led salah because apparently there's no imam there. And I, well, that's another story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so finished the salah, salat al maghrib, and this guy just, I get up to leave and he just follows me and he's like, I have a question. I said, sure. And he said, um, how do you read Quran? <laughs> like, kif takra. I was like, how? It's unfathomable, right? And I was just like, uh, you know, I read it. But, okay, but where did you learn it? I said, in school. <laughs> and he's like, but how? <laughs> right? You know? And I said, going to class and uh, <laughs> reciting to a teacher. Okay, mashallah, but you know, it's just, subhanAllah, mashallah, 
I was, I was just like, okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> you know, so I do get that a lot. Uh, there's there's always um, an element of people who um, who who don't realize that that, and it's not really their fault, but they just don't realize that there are so many other uh, Muslims out there that they might not actually even know of. So. Yeah. I get it all the time. Um, when I was younger, I used to get really upset by it because it was just the unending uh, barrage of points that I have to bring up in order to affirm my identity. But now it's just like, sure, whatever, man. You, know. you don't get it from this generation. You probably get it from our older generation, right? No, I do. I get it from both old and young. I've got young, you know, younger people who – Instead of asking me if I'm a convert, they fully embrace uh, their fake PhD in stereotyping. <laughs> and they're just like, so do you know karate, Shiv? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like uh, – I'd like to apologize. In their <laughs> nah, it's fine, dude. Do you know – do you know – do you know martial arts? <laughs> <laughs> because that would be so cool. I was like, sure, yes, I did study it. Wait, do you really? I studied no, it for I'm a little bit. <laughs> I did study it for a little bit, but then I got real bored of it uh -huh. uh, because it's just. Uh, um, I mean, I did dabble a little bit in wushu, and I just realized just too much dancing going around and too much hand movements. <laughs> Yeah, not, it, would, not, it would never work in a real street fight. No, no, because they they would just probably just start laughing. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> right. So, so I do get it. Yes. Yeah. So talk to us a little about your family history uh, as it pertains to Islam. Like, how far back do y'all go? So um, I think the 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 number is I'm either the twenty seventh or the twenty eighth generation. Yes, Mashallah. and so th this has been. Um, for a very long time, um, my grandparents are, as you know, most of the people who are in Taiwan, they originally came from China. I mean, they were not aboriginals. Um, so, uh, my it's really my father's side. So, you know, we trace our lineage back to uh, Central Asia. And um, as for the authenticity and the validity of how far we can trace it and who it is, eh, whatever. Um, but overall, yeah, um, come from a line of Muslims, alhamdulillah, line of scholarship as well. And um, to be honest with you, this last name that I have, Chow, is not an original last name. It was given to us by the emperor of that time, whose last name was Chow. Right. And I guess it was just by royal edict where because you've been so loyal to the state and to the emperor and to the imperial dynasty, you shall inherit this name from now on. So it's just like, yes, I guess. <laughs> well, how, how, how did your family inherit Islam though? So we're originally uh, Central Asian. So, we're, so uh, uh, according to the um, – we actually have a book in our family where we trace it back, and apparently they are um, Bukhari originally. Oh, okay. Yeah. There so, yeah, I was my, ask my, you that. Actually, my family is also from Bukhara, and yeah. uh, actually, I, I would say, which is contemporary uh, three, Uzbekistan. Yeah, yes, about three generations back. Twenty sure. generations is how many years, roughly? I'm not good at math. Sorry, I just destroyed it, another. Like how much is generation? Six, sixty years. Or 80 years? No, no, no. no 100. 100? No, no. 100. Each generation is yeah. about 20-something years. Maybe 20 or 30, right? Yeah. Okay. So then you're looking at 20, 30 times thirty times 30, 900 years? I would say maybe a little bit less than like seven, It's like 750? Maybe. Yeah. So they've been Muslim longer than Daisies? You've been Muslim longer than most Daisies, right? I've been Muslim for 33 years. <laughs> 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 oh, are you 33 years, Michelle? You don't look 33 years old. Yes. I don't want to ask you how old you were. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's all in that food. No, know? but what is it about the Uzbeks that – how do they travel so far? Because I know so many people in India are – they have had, had that too. same lineage. And yeah. I know they travel to China as well. Is that an interesting but, phenomenon that happened yeah. with the Turks and the Uzbeks and stuff like that? Right? Yeah. Except well, that's how – I mean, that's how most of the Muslims in in China are, right? And, and uh, I mean, they're, they're generally of two – of two lineages. I wouldn't say lineages, but of two ethnic, you know, origins. Either they are of Turkic origin yeah. somewhere, 
up there long, long, long time ago, or they are actually Turkic, like yeah. people from Xinjiang, people from yeah. Turkestan, um, and you know, and of course, my family, we are Hui Muslims. So Hui Muslims, uh, that word Hui means in Chinese means something returned to, right? So uh, Hui Muslims are basically Muslims in China who. Probably a long time ago, like myself, you know, right. seven hundred years ago, they were originally Turkic or or Arab or whatever. Yeah. But they've sinicized right. fully into the Chinese society, so they look Chinese, they speak Chinese, but they uh, they just have Islamic. Um, that's all, that's awesome because it's me and Sheikh Amr are from the same city in India, Hyderabad, and we have the same issue, like uh, a lot of Turkish and a lot of Uzbek, and um, they literally just, it's just a big melting pot of, that's why you see a lot of different skin colors over there, you see different colored eyes, you can see Sheikh Amr's eyes, the cloudy blue, you'll get lost Mashallah. in them if you, if you gaze into them a, a little bit too long. Mm. <laughs> A lot of the sisters have to keep their eyes down and talk to them. So, like, how many years, how many generations do you guys go back as far as uh, being in America? So, my, um, so my, it was actually my grandfather that moved to the United States in the 80s. Um, actually, I would say probably the late 70s. Um, and uh, I wasn't born in America. I was born in Malaysia. Uh, um, so... Yes, I am, you know, my parents are from Taiwan. They were born in Taiwan, but, you know, I was born in Malaysia. So, doesn't really make me a Malaysian either because I was born and within a month, boom, uh, we moved to Saudi for a couple of years because my dad had work there. Um, and, uh, you know, our families are, my family is all over the world. Literally, I've got uncles in Australia. We've got family, you know, family members from, you know, relatives from Thailand, from Myanmar, you know, so... The Chinese Muslim diaspora ends up marrying a lot of other Chinese Muslim diaspora from Myanmar, from Thailand, from Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just, you know, we're now in the United States. So I came to America in, in 86. Okay. Um, to California? Yes. Is this the, you're in the Bay Area or the so SoCal? Yeah, it was the Bay Area. And then uh, we moved out to SoCal for a little bit. And you and came from Saudi Arabia? Yes. It was just like, like me. Yeah. Like the I came from Medina. Yeah. I'm a child from there. And he, I recently went back to Medina and none of my people recognized me. And I was very upset by it. He tries to act like I'm born in the deserts of Medina. He's, he goes, he, Look, he, you he have tries to, to pull some, You have to add some drama on because everyone has this romantic vision of Medina. Rightfully so, of course. Sure. But when you're coming to America, no one is from Medina. Then, and, and get also, I was my, 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 don't fir get into my it, first bro. name is Asayed. I was born in Ramadan. Wow. Mashallah. Say mashallah. You so you were born yeah. fasting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> are, are you Qureshi too? Uh, it's, there, there's uh, there's whispers about it. And there's rumors. So you might be the Mehdi, basically. He's he's this. I, I thought right. about it actually. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. We're here yeah. first. Mad Mom looks. We got. We got the Mehdi <laughs> on the podcast. Actually, Chow, we're actually going to interview this guy. <laughs> exactly. I'm ready to give Bayon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you, so you're, because that's how you became a Niners fan, though, because you're in the Bay Area. Yeah. And the Niners in the 80s were like the, you know, top team in the NFL. Yeah, now of they're, course. Now they're a train wreck. But like, Yeah, of course. They're a train wreck right now. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I growing up, I didn't follow them that much because, uh, you know, it's just. I mean, there's other things to do. <laughs> so I didn't really follow them until Guess much later. Was a Niner fan all as well. It's supposed to be a Medina thing, you know. We're, we're people who have. I, I came in '85. You came it's in '86. It's, it's a Bukhari thing. <laughs> a Bukhari thing. Oh, wow. I, I think I found uh, a blood brother from long ago from and something, something from assassin's creed related yeah, you know yeah, that's absolutely. i don't know if anyone out there plays this, that game but they'll get that joke i'm also a niners fan by the way yeah that's my they're my favorite team so it's been painful to watch but <laughs> it is it is so now you like did um uh hipsal quran in california yeah so um I'll be really honest with you. This the the the, the chapter in my life of of doing tahfil at, at you know at a at a school at a boarding school was you know up until you know a few years ago it was a I consider it to be a very painful chapter in my life and it took me a lot of years to sort of get Indo Pak run I take it is it Indo Pak run 
type of uh, madrasa setting? Sure, yeah. Generally. <laughs> no yeah. problem, we're all Daisy. So are you, are you like the only non-Daisy there? So, yeah. So there were like, you know, obviously they were all Daisy, but you know, they, you know, they, yeah, pretty much. There were a few other people, but they were obviously originally. Uh, but why, uh, why, why painful? What do you mean? Painful in the sense of not really sure why the hell I was there. Hmm, why so? You know, so it's just like the idea of, oh, you know, my son is going to go to uh, is going to go to middle school soon, and you know he might just start picking up a joint. He might start drinking. So what do we do? We just throw him into a madrasa, <laughs> like that solves anything. Mm. Uh, so you know it, it was it was it was sort of a uh, a, a very strange experience. Um, and this is around like 89, 90? No, this was in the early ni- – this was in the 90s, yeah, um, uh, closer to the mid-90s. So, you're like 12 – you're like 12 years yeah, old, 15 years yeah. old. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, you know, and, uh, you know, madrasa is madrasa. Things happen. You see kids get hit. You see a lot of things and you experience a lot of things there. But um, I'll be honest with you. Um, it's it's it, it feels like a factory to me. Yeah. Right, um, and this is this is coming from someone who's Chinese, right? So it feels like a factory, <laughs> you know. So, so, so I know what I know what sweatshops are, right? I know what what assembly line is like, you know. So, so you've got you've I, got. By the way, before you continue, when I first saw you, you look like a real serious dude. I was like, how are we gonna make him like chill out and be like super chill and joke around? But mashallah, right? no, I knew it was gonna be like we 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 hung out before. Okay, cool. So cool, I know, cool. like, yeah, I was I was worried y'all were gonna like prejudge him. I, I, yeah, I, we were prejudging. You just seem like a nice serious brother, mashallah. You know, I was like I, I whispered to Mahin Asian after you left. Experience. Yeah, I whispered to Mahin after you left. So I'm like, oh, are you sure we're gonna be able to have a good conversation with him because? Kind of quiet. <laughs> oh, you have to save it up, right? You yeah. don't want to show all your cards, right? That's yeah, true. That's true. Anyway, so yeah, so mother and it was, it was, it was, uh, it was. You know, I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, uh, there, there, there's no proper training on how do you do tafid Quran, right? So for yeah. someone like me who memorized Quran through listening through through just listening to tapes, um, I didn't understand how to, you know. Memorize the, the the concept of how do you memorize? How do you um, start with a word and you repeat a few phrases together? That was a science completely unknown to me, right? And so, um, my teacher um, um, was. I mean, I had a couple of teachers in that school, but um, it. I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but you know, when I first started memorizing, I started off with Surah Hadid. Uh, and it took me a month to memorize that, even though Surah Hadid is only a couple of pages, right? But it took me so long to memorize that surah because you're just you're just learning how to do something that you have no clue what you're doing. But how much did you have memorized prior to this? You know what I mean? About three juz. Three juz. Okay. Yeah. So memorizing over sound has a lot of benefit because especially if you have like good sound memory etc it sticks with you but that's not the proper way of how you memorize mm-hmm. so when i was at that place it was great you know you 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 just encounter so many new things that someone who's not familiar with the indo-pac culture like for example what's for breakfast what's for nashta okay nashta. um it's <laughs> cream cheese with shahad and roti <laughs> I was like, what is that white chunk on that plate? Like, what the heck is that? And they're like, it's very nice. And they're just like pouring. By the way, to the listeners, he's shaking his head side to side doing the Daisy thing it's while like, he's talking. You know, and it's like, uh, it's like honey. And I was just like, okay, you know. And, and, you know, you get to eat like nice food or so you think it's nice food. Um and, you know, that's where you started picking up Urdu, this and that. Um, you know, obviously, you learn all the bad words, you know, the K word and, you know, all these other bad words that you, you, you know. <laughs> What's the What's K, K word? word? Really? <laughs> Kangaroo? I, I guess dog barking. <laughs> Perhaps of the four-legged persuasion. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you just learn a lot of things, right? That's for any language you learn. Yeah. You always learn the bad words first, right? So, when I was there, um, it was just... Um, very, very uh, interesting because, you know, all the kids would speak in a language. They all spoke English, but they would all speak in 
Urdu, and um, there was th- there is an element of privilege. That is, they think that their version of Islam is the acceptable and one and only. So I remember this conversation very well when when they were talking about hellfire one time, um, and they were just saying the Persian word for it, which is dozakh. Yeah, and I was like, "What's dozakh?" <laughs> and they were like, "You don't know what." Is like, like it was almost like where have you been this entire life right and they start throwing new words like guna and this and that and now what's guna okay like what is that dude like seriously throw me a bone okay and it's like they're they're like you're like dude this guy doesn't know anything man. so guna is a sin for all our non decent yeah. listeners no yeah. they know they know Don't they worry. know they'll figure it out <laughs> right and, and you know it's you just sort of learn things and obviously you pick up so many other things that you didn't know about Islam like. Don't you ever sit in the Mulvi Saab's chair or else you will lose all your knowledge. I was like, really? Let me try that. Bam! Sit right there. I think I still recall everything. <laughs> Challenge accepted, you know, and, and clearly, you know, nothing happened, right? And where they're like, oh, you know, you, you've got to like, um, do this or do that or else this is going to happen. And I was just like, hmm, okay. So, uh, you know, I was there for, you know, a very short period. I would say about a year. And honestly, um, I just didn't like the environment. Um, um, and I, I, I don't think it was right for me. Mm-hmm. So um, I just sort of one day during Christmas, uh, Christmas break, I just sort of packed my bags and my dad came to pick me up for break. And I just said to him, we're done. We're not, I'm not going back. Right. And how long, how long have you been here so far? Until at at the said, school? Oh, yeah. a year, right? About a year plus. Oh, and then after a year, you basically told him. Yeah, a year yeah. plus. I was like, we're done. I'm not going back anymore. And he was, you know, obviously he was uh, just sort of confused. And and um, and to be honest with you, you know, that's – I've had some, um, you know, some issues, you know, with my father about this. Like, you know, I, I was, you know, 12 years old then. Like, really? What would a 12-year-old know about their future, right? So – but then I was assertive about that for the first time. And I just said, you know, I don't want to. But then he just sort of said, well, we got to find something else for, for you. So um, instead of the boarding school option, we ended up going to another school where you just, you know, go and do the half right the day. Type setting. Well, not really, but it was not run by Daisies. Okay. So you just go to the school during the day and then you can go back home. So it was a little bit different. And, um, and I just progressed through that. Um, um, the one thing I did um, enjoy about the other school uh, was it was a completely different culture. So that's where I first was exposed to Isaaga and oh, those Egyptian, Egyptian. yeah, <laughs> you know. And I had this uh, Egyptian Masha who were just just speaking in the most colloquial Arabic ever. Mm-hmm. And you know, for someone who just dabbled in Urdu Man. and all the K words and all the other words. Um, now I'm like, oh, you know, now I'm going to be dabbling in Arabic. So I started dabbling in Arabic. So during this time, I had a, a, a crisis of faith. I had a very strong crisis of faith. Um, um, I shut the Quran. I didn't want to be a Muslim anymore. And I really hated Islam for, for a while in my life. How much of the, to the hifs did you had completed at this point? I would say, I can't remember. It was a sizable chunk already. Okay. And I, I I just felt like, you know, this – this. I had to put everything on pause. Yeah, and pretty well, what, what age are you right now? I was 13. probably – no, it was probably like by now I was like 14. Okay. 14. Um, um, you know, so I, I, I had this crisis of faith where I felt – uh, um, a a high level of hypocrisy in the Muslim community. You know, like why is it – like why do I have to memorize the Quran? Like, yeah. Why do I have to? Um, and I was manipulated into that, into thinking like, oh, it's a great thing and therefore if you don't complete it, then you are um, breaking your promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. right? So you know, it's very interesting. I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's that I hear that many times with students that, especially that age, at that age, that's very turbulent for someone to hear. And someone told them, if you don't finish, once you start and you don't finish, like in that time period, then you know you're going to forget all of it. It's very difficult for you to get in jannah. There's a lot of scary things that are yeah. said to children, right? I don't. And you're just kind of mentioning that. That's why uh, you know it's, uh, and I can imagine that transition. It is. Um, you know, and uh, one thing I just want to ask you, and we can continue from there. Because the first madrasa you were at, since you were you were a non-desi, did you kind of get 
like a little better treatment than everybody else, or did you? No, I actually it was from it the was, teachers. I'm saying it was full on exoticization. What does that mean? Like just full on, like wow, like the whole time, know, you know, like like ooh, you know, like ooh, oh, this, you're like exotic, yeah, exotic, exotic okay. but but at the same time, I didn't enjoy. Um, you know the, the the honeymoon period for that finished very quickly um, because um, you just see what you see in a regular madrasa. You know, kids getting slapped and and you know. But did that same stuff happen to you too, or they just kind of left you alone? Because no, they they you know I think they kind of left me alone in the beginning, but then you know soon after that you know um, I guess I guess they thought ah it's okay you know <laughs> just, you know. Did you did you tell your parents about that or? I did. I want to keep it hush hush. You know, I did. I did tell my parents about the, the that kind of stuff. And look, you know, you know, this kind of crap happens. Yeah. But but it's just sort of like you 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 know, when you're at that age, you really don't know what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Right. You very really confusing. It's very confusing, and choices are made for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, what would a twelve year old know? Right. right? Um, so, you know, it was, it was, it was just like, uh, oh, you know, the chink is here, you know, and they would say, you know, these sort of things and, you know, just obviously you don't, you, just, you don't really feel it until you grow up later. Like, wow, what a, what that was a, pretty bad. Yeah. Like what a terrible experience. Like, like for someone who does, who came from just a normal Muslim family, um, and be forced into that kind of a, se- you know, setting and then to be religiously ostracized. Right. right? Uh, it's, it's just, it just led to that moment where you just feel like, why would I want to be a part of a deen where I'm racially um, discriminated, where I am, you know, forced to memorize something that adults themselves don't do? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why should I have to bear the burden, you know, of that task, you know? Um, and, you know, you, I mean, you look at all these parents that send their kids to the, to the school. Not a single one of them is a hafal. Not a single one of them is a hafal. And I felt – that's where I felt really angry about like why should I be a part of a religion where people are told to do something where they themselves don't practice it, right? So, um, so I started on this journey of, you know uh, – Let's start the smorgasbord of religions, right? Let's start picking which religion is good out there, right? So I started thinking, okay, let's try Hinduism, right? And so your parents know that you're dabbling in other religions, or they don't know? Yeah, that? I did. I told them that. Okay. So I just, you what know, was the reaction? How did they? They were just sort of like, oh, like you know, not knowing what to do. It was not anger, but it was just like, uh, okay, well, it was just sort of like, okay, we'll just let him figure it out. So, you know, I started looking to Hinduism and obviously, uh, you know, as a teenager, you can only get so many resources on it and it didn't really appeal to me. Um, um, and then I started going, looking at Judaism and I was like, oh, okay, well, clearly not for me either. <laughs> and then, uh, then I started looking at Buddhism and all these things and reincarnation didn't make any sense to me. And um, I will always um, uh, credit my grandfather, Allah um, mm-hmm. uh, You know, he, he actually sat me down and, and, and we had discussions about deen, about Islam. That's like the first time in my life where, um, you know, we actually had a proper discussion about the deen, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and it, and, it, and it clicked in my head. And I just realized I'm sitting here with legitimate grievances on about the dean and the practitioners of the dean. But I don't really know the dean enough. I really don't know the dean enough to, 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 to conclude whether this is the truth or not. And I say that loud and clear because I think for a lot of young people today, Muslims, Muslim youth, they will always have that question mark lingering in the back of their head. Is Islam really the truth? You know, are we really following the deen? Are we really following the the true religion? What if another religion was true, right? So, I had to go through that phase and, and, and you know, and uh, started going to college after that, finished high school. And then afterwards, um, you know, um, uh, I I sort of it was sort of like also my decision, but it was also partially my father's decision as well. And so I, you know, went to Medina and studied. So I'm sorry to cut you, off, but one thing that I'm curious about is when you're in college, uh, did you distance yourself from Muslims because you don't want to have anything to do with them, or is it you're like you just keep them as friends, but you don't want to, you know, how did that work with like Muslim on campus and just Muslims in general so, after that? 
because I did homeschooling, which um, which completely screwed up my academics, right? Which is another topic I want to talk about later. Um, unless you know, this is what I would say: unless you're re- you have parents who are really on top of your education, when you go to a madrasa, your academics suffer tremendously. Okay, because it requires a great deal of independence. It requires a great deal of, you know, you have to follow up on it. And I'll be honest with you, in the 90s, how good was homeschooling back then? Seriously, compared to now, 20 years later. So, academics sort of went down the toilet. So, as a result, going to college was very frustrating because didn't have the proper, um, you know, a foundational building in, in, in the sciences and the math. And I was never a math person, but I was not ever afraid of math. But it became, it became more of a burden. So, you know, I admit it that, it, you know, going to Medina was just sort of like a, an escape route. So we're like, Oh, I don't have to deal with the sciences anymore. Um, so, you know, apply to Medina. And the interesting thing is, um, when you asked me earlier about, you know, being the youngest graduate of Medina, you know, of Amer- you know, American, the true, the, the reason I say allegedly is because I don't qualify for that because I entered the university using Taiwanese nationality because I knew I would get a better chance at getting accepted as a rare nationality than as opposed to American. And how old were you when you when you matriculated at Medina? Uh, I was seventeen. Okay, I should have done the same because I got rejected from Medina. Because of Daisy? Yeah, my people. Yeah, <laughs> this, I did the whole interview and everything. Got rejected, and I should have applied under Taiwanese. <laughs> yeah, you should, <laughs> yeah. Becky. You should have. But anyways, go ahead. Dude. We'll talk. We'll have a separate podcast. I, I'm you, still upset about that. Little, yeah. Anyways, go. Ahead. <laughs> yeah. So you know, went to Medina, um, but then, Alhamdulillah. Um, now I have a better understanding of who I am. Um, you know, now I have already surpassed my identity crisis as a Muslim. So, I'll but you were still so wrestling this already cut you off during your time in Medina too, though. No, not anymore. Not, okay, not anymore. And you know, it, it just sort of like I said because. Um, I th- I felt that I had a responsibility that if I was going to become a murta, if I was going to become an apostate, right, I better at least know what I'm leaving behind, right? <laughs> you know, better be an informed apostate <laughs> than a jahil apostate, right? <laughs> murta alim versus a murta jahil, right? You know, so. <laughs> you know, whatever. So, <laughs> my parents, my dad lived in Saudi for like about ten years. So as a result. Alhamdulillah, I, you know, um, I'm very grateful to my father for preparing me, you know, emotionally for that. I mean, obviously, he pushed me to go there. Um, but, um, but you know, he gave me a lot of good tips because I think, you know, the last experience, you know, throwing me into the into the pool, you yeah. know, um, it was the pool of masala. <laughs> you know, it, was, it didn't really turn out well. <laughs> So, so it was just like, oh okay. You know. our, our Dio Bundy or our Brown listeners are pretty upset right now. <laughs> no, it's all good. Sorry. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about remedying these issues too, inshallah, today. Yeah. But anyway. So, you know, going to Medina. Um, obviously, alhamdulillah, I, I was really emotionally prepared better for it than a lot of other American students. I think a lot of American students who go to Medina, not all of them, they have this romanticized view of the Arab world. They don't really know about the culture versus the people. And I was told straight up by my dad. And this is the rule I live by. The impossible happens there. And the possible is impossible there. Okay. Mm. Things that you think are naturally occurring that should naturally happen easily, they don't happen. And things that you do not imagine that they could happen, somehow they happen. Right. So, you know, so so I was there not really, and I admit it, you know, I wasn't like the other students who were like, yeah, we're going to go down there, you know, seek knowledge. I'm just like, I'm going there for college. You know, nice. so it's a very different mindset versus, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, we're just going to go to Medina and just, you know, seek out the sacred science, sciences, you know, actually that word sacred was not applied back then, <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the seeking of the knowledge, you know, it was, it wasn't, it was, it was just more of, okay, I'm going to call it to there. Great. So, you know, before I went to Medina, I actually was studying the Mahad in Virginia for a year and a half and it really helped me prepare my Arabic. Um, Went to Medina, studied theology, and I always got flack for going to Kulit Dawa Suluddin. You know, I was like, why are you going to the lazy college? I was like, what are you talking about? Why is it lazy? Like, oh, you should just go to Kulit Sharia. I was like, 
you know, I don't really care for difference of opinions. <laughs> like two or three is great, but I don't need ten aqual. Not not like disrespect to the tradition of of the diversity of opinion, but I'm like, it just doesn't interest you. It's just like I don't really care for it. Mm. They're all like, huh, yeah, go to your dawa, <laughs> and you know. And so I went to Kuli Dawa, but you know, it's uh, anyone who actually knew Medina back then before the system changed in 2006 from a regular seminary to a credit system will know that um, credit that was actually very intensive as well. I it, heard. It's very intensive because they slap you with like four different uh, um, um, majors. It's like you have to study a lot of tarbiyah. You have to study a lot of history. You have to study a lot of da'wah and a lot of aqidah, right? Comparative religions too, right? Yeah, comparative religions and yeah. and, and, and and sects and this and that. Uh, so, you know, learning about the different sects within Islam and, you know, why this group is like this. I mean, you learn a lot, but um, subhanAllah, I think it's a very underappreciated uh, college. I agree with you, man. Yeah, and trust me, Every person that comes back to their country to do da'wah will realize how how important it is to understand how to da'wah. Like, but I heard there's not a lot of Americans or guys from the West in, in Kuliyat da'wah, right? I mean, there was a few during my time. But they're mainly in Usul din or in, in Kuliyat Sharia, right? Well, during my time, Kuliyat da'wah was, was actually two Kuliyat. It was Kuliyat da'wah Usul din Now they split it into Kuliyat da'wah and Kuliyat Usul din That's the same thing in Egypt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, they yeah. split it up. Um, so, you know, Alhamdulillah, Medin was a, was, a, was, a, was a, you know, just five years there. One year for Arabic, four years of bachelors. And then and, you know, came so, back. So you knew Arabic a little bit already. I knew. No, it's a two-year program, right? Yeah. So I had studied one and a half years before that. So it really did help. Um, and you know, even though Quran memorization started in a painful, you know, way, but it really, I do appreciate my father for that because the having the Quran memorized it really gives you a major leg up over people who don't know Quran. It really gives you a leg up in ways that you cannot imagine. When did you actually finish the HIFS then? I was like 15 or 16. So right through the – what program were you doing at that time? Because I don't think you mentioned that. It was in California. It was a school run by Egyptians. The Egyptians. Remember? The Egyptian club. That yeah. one? Okay, yeah. That one. Okay. And it was it was good because, you know, it, it, they, they, they really um, were just more chill, I guess. And no beating know? either? I think there was like light – you know, like the, Egyptians. Uh, like when, the way you the Egyptians only hit the Egyptians usually, right? Is it is it the the way you beat your wife kind of deal? St- that one? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't know that. You know, uh, okay. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, what are you trying to get out of him, bro? Because like, you know they had that like you know the miswak beaten. <laughs> okay, we'll get we'll it. later. <laughs> Another topic. We'll talk about. We'll, yeah, we'll talk about beating later. Don't worry. Did, did, I, I just throw that comment in just to get two hundred hate messages purposefully, <laughs> just to let you know. Yeah, because it, it generates good. Uh, which they have activity on Facebook, but move, carry on. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, came back to America, and um, uh, I'll be honest with you, um, I rarely talk about this, uh, so I will talk about it now. Going to Medina was very, very stressful as well because there were some people um, in Medina who got in trouble with the law, and the FBI was really hell bent on getting me to testify against these people. Is that Ahmed Abu Ali? Ahmed Abu Ali, Sabri bin Kahla, uh, you know, the Virgi- Virginia paintball case was in full swing during that time. Oh boy. And, you know, you know those it, guys. You know, and I really didn't really know them. It was through, you know, just, I don't really know them, but they would always try to pin something on me like, oh, we need you to come testify. We need you to do this and that. And they tried to threaten me by saying, if you don't, we're going to subpoena you and blah, blah, blah. You know how the, uh, the system back then was is, um, if you uh, did ta'jil, if you tried to um, take a semester or two off of Medina, back then, that was pretty much signing your ticket out. Like, you're never coming back, especially if they found out that the FBI was interested in talking to you. So, it was a very – so, it was like – it was in my third – it was in my third year of kuliya in college and it was like, I can't deal with this. Like, kuliya, I, by the way, means faculty. Faculty, yeah. the college ahead, of. Yeah. So, it's just sort of like, I can't deal with this because – I've already invested so many years in th- down this now. If I get subpoenaed um, for something that they're trying to find on someone else, it's going to be a waste. I can't finish my bachelor's degree. But Alhamdulillah, Subhanahu wa Taala, I was very merciful, and you know they found whatever they want from other people, and you know. Um, so as a result, um, you know, came back to America the following year, and I started working in teaching. 
And oh, how naive I was. You know, teaching is so difficult. So I taught in Islamic school. Um, and, you know, I was in I, then I, what state? This was in uh, the DC area. Cool. Um, and it was like middle school, high school, graduate. Uh, no, it was just, it was just like uh, lower grades and okay. uh, middle school, you know, and, you know, teaching is, I always tell people this. Just because you studied the dean, it doesn't mean you are a teacher. I agree with you 100%. Okay. <laughs> so When you first realize it, it's a big slap in the face. Oh, it's not just a slap. It's very humbling. It's very, very humbling. And it's it's just, you know, I started teaching and you, you, you make so many mistakes. You bumps and mistakes along the way like, oh, well, this doesn't work. Oh, well, yelling doesn't work. Oh, well, uh, bribing with candy doesn't work either, you know? <laughs> And then, you know, alhamdulillah, um, you just sort of learn along the way that, you know, you can't just assume that studying the dean means you know how education works or how pedagogy works. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that that sort of assumption is a very, very arrogant assumption, right? Yeah. So, but, you know, one thing I learned is, and, you know, um, yeah, the first year of teaching is difficult, second year, but for me – the way to solidify even yourself as a person, your dealings with people Mm -hmm. because they don't know what you're trying to teach them. The beginning here, they don't know anything, right? Of what you're trying to teach them. So it solidifies you on a human level. It solidifies you on almost like a therapist level. I used to see it as like the best way for me to teach is put myself in the shoes of a therapist and then project. How would a therapist project knowledge, right? Right. And that's what made it a lot easier for me in the beginning. And you have to understand, you can't have any preconceived notions about what people know. You know, that's what, when I first tried, when I first tried learning Arabic, I tried learning Arabic from people who are Arab and there's a lot of expectations that they expect you to already know to have while learning the Arabic language. So they start off with a whole bunch of Naho and this and that, and you don't even know how to speak the language yet. You don't know any words. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that that's one way I really felt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, uh, had to put you through a grueling process and you have to like cringy moments you have to have you probably know what I'm talking about there's a lot of cringy moments that when you think about when you first started teaching you're like man I can't believe that happened you know and you never forget those things unfortunately yeah. you know but you know I, I think that alhamdulillah I mean it's all a part of it but now it, it made you a phenomenal teacher I'm pretty sure mashallah <laughs> I wouldn't say phenomenal <laughs> but it, you know it, after so many years of grueling work and and just sort of tinkering around you 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 um, uh, you know, the last place, I mean, I work right now in the oil and gas industry in Schlumberger. I mean, honestly, if you told me 15 years ago I was work, I would work for Schlumberger, I would laugh at your face and be like, intimate, you know, you're crazy. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, you know, for obviously for financial reasons, you know, but, um, uh, Teaching is still my passion. I really do love teaching. I teach right now in Houston, um, on the side Sunday school for kids. Um, it's, it's a, it's a humbling experience. You, 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 you got to deal with different kids and not take knowledge for granted. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to, it's going to be a little backtracking, but it'll be for productivity purposes, inshallah. I know that even Mahim was mentioning to us that you have a lot, you have many thoughts of reformation uh, as far as the madrasa system. And the way I think of it is it's here and it's here to stay, yeah. you know, and there's, you know, the one thing about the madrasa system is there's thousands of madrasas in every state. Of course. Right. So they're here to stay. Alhamdulillah, you know, they they have, They've done amazing work with people memorizing the Quran. Yeah. We all realize the value later, um, even though some of them are very painful experiences for many people. But how do we take this platform that's given in a thousand of these in every state of just a huge, as you mentioned, factory of memorizers of Quran, and how do we make it relevant? How do we make it uh, something that's very welcoming? You know, I know I know that everyone that goes through this, like yourself, you had to have sat, sat down some time and uh, 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 thought, okay, you know what? If this was done, this is actually a lot better. It's actually feasible. It can be yeah. done. And then yeah, after this happened, you probably went through a step-by-step process. And maybe even forming your own mothers. Like calling your mothers would be completely different until other mothers has adopted that system, sure, right? Sure, of course. You know, so like what, what, what do you, what do you, uh, what thoughts do you have on that? So, look. Because we know it's an issue, but we, what, are, what are some solutions you think? So, here's, okay. First and foremost, I appreciate what parents want for their kids. I don't want to make this into like, you know, shame on parents or shame on this of course, or shame on of that. Of course. I think all parents have good intentions. Of course. Um, however, I think it's the fear of the unknown. It's the so-called standardization of, of 
you know, your social class and standing that you're afraid for your child in the future that, oh, if he doesn't become this or if he doesn't become a doctor, engineer, you know, bichara, this kid, you know, just send him to a madrasa. Right, and it's like it's so it's so awkward seeing you say or er, er, uh, do words. How, how do you do it? Let's just do. He's a bichara right now. How do you do it? Like, I know. How do you do it? Like uh, living a mother. Say it. I just. Say it. <laughs> I, you so know, funny. like 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 how I, I just, just do it. it. Like Trump, I just do it. I'm just gonna do it. You know, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> you guys gonna we gotta take a picture of him doing that so oh, they can man. we can be like, hey, at this time of this thing, this is the face he made. You know, but yeah. So the people who say who are advocating for us to do video, you, you like video cast, this would be one for. Yeah, definitely. You know, they they, they gotta see. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, I know Joe Bradford really would get a kick out of seeing. Oh yeah, <laughs> you. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure you. Yeah, pretty you well. and Joe you guys, are pretty. You guys, good get, you, yeah. you guys, if you guys are on a podcast together, you guys would love the heck out of it. Man. Wait, why isn't he here for us? When we come to Houston, we, we will do awesome. a show with both you guys. Sure. Inshallah. 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 Yeah. But anyways, yeah. So I was thinking about Trump. I don't know why I was thinking about Trump. Right now, he he, he like thought about Trump and lost all brain cells. I, <laughs> lost if, did you forget the Quran? Rest now. <laughs> oh man. No, he just said Urdu because you see you made he's interesting how you know Urdu, but anyway. Yeah, so you know, it's um it, it it's look, for every for every parent I look, every parent needs to do what they need to do. But I want to tell parents just because your kid is not seemingly succeeding in a certain way that you want them to succeed in, you shouldn't just automatically push him into that realm. Okay. And I'm saying as this for some, from someone who's a teacher for almost a decade. And I will say, look, you know, you have that old cartoon that we've all seen where you have a teacher sitting, uh, you know, it's like this uh, newspaper print is a guy sitting in front of a, 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 there's a teacher sitting in front of a table and they're outside, there's a tree and there are all these different animals there and there's one with a fishbowl and they're like, now we're going to test you on how to climb the tree, right? You can't, you can't use the same standardization of success based on your cultural and nationalistic whatever views of what culture uh, success means and then say, well, since you don't fit this and this and this and this, therefore we're going to slap you into the, the pun intended, we're going to slap you into the, 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 that other system to make you successful, right? right. Um, so that's the first thing I would say, you know, give your kids a chance, you know, if, if they're not succeeding in, in the dean, I'm sorry, if they're not succeeding in the sciences and in the math and those sort of things, don't just automatically give up on them, right? Did you get them a tutor? Did you work with them? You know, is try other things, right? And the second thing that I would say is schools need to be properly standardized. I know it's going to be very, very difficult, but the, you, you need to provide kids with something, especially teenagers, more than just tahfidh of Quran. You need to provide them with understanding the Quran, how to have the proper adab and the akhlaq. It's not just the simple perfunctory stuff of make sure you close the Quran when you finish reading and turn it on the proper way. Or like, as I was told one time, I was shamed, I was shamed horrifically of sitting on a chair and reading Quran and then someone, other kid was sitting in a corner they're like, you can't sit on the chair. I'm like, why? Your butt's above the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're growing up, it was your knees are above the Quran. Oh, the, I, this is the first time I heard your butt talks. Your above the butt <laughs> is elevated above the Quran. I was like, so what about people on the second floor? <laughs> <laughs> What about people flying in the plane? <laughs> like, and then, or like other stuff like, oh, you can't have your slippers, um, you know, up, you know, the, the, the bottom part facing up because that's rude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm like, mm, well, every masjid out there is pretty damn rude <laughs> because just go look at the ship ship and the, you know, the chapel situation at the masjid. I mean, oh, the hypocrisy I'm there. I'm sorry you had to go face that. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the hypocrisy there. They all went in there to pray to Allah while insulting Allah with their chapels <laughs> you know so, what about the, the feet facing the fibla? oh yeah like oh my God. your toes how dare you how mm -hmm. dare you point your toes to the Kaaba mm -hmm. you know Be'esharam <laughs> how dare you you know and it's like okay oh um, my God you know it's, it, look, it's, it's, it's it, you know it's just uh, cultural stuff you know so that's what I always tell you know students or parents go into the school um, knowing what you want don't just don't export parental duties to a school. Know what you want. 
Know what the school offers. Really check out what, if you're so diligent on your other kids going into proper colleges and proper school, why aren't you doing due diligence for this? You need to know who the teachers are, right? You need to know what's the curriculum. How's the homeschooling? You know, you have to do, you know, due diligence. And I always say to the kids, Memorization of the Quran is a stepping stone. You should not let it get to your head where you think, oh, I'm Hafizab now, you know, I'm, you know, I'm amazing or this and that. That's just a stepping stone. You know, the scholars of the past, whenever they used the word al-hafil, it was never for the hafil of the Quran. It was for the hafil of the mutun and the sacred texts and the hadith, right? So, you know, hafil is a great thing. I think it's beautiful, but you know, parents need to know what they're getting themselves in, into and really understand that if you're going to do it, you know, have a discussion with your child about it, right? Um, because if you don't, you're making the decision on their behalf. Well, when you say having a discussion, I like that you brought that up. But I mean, based on somebody who is your age, approximately 12 years old, right? Um, when you first started, how how, do, how would you prefer the discussion to go? I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't know. There's a million ways to answer Yeah, let's it. say it was your, your, your own kid that yeah. you're sending now. I w- so if it was my kid, I wouldn't send them there because I, I don't believe in the, in the idea of isolating them in another world. And but it was an advantage to you. Like during uh, when you were interviewed by Medina, they, they must have asked you about how much you memorized the Quran. I know sure. they asked me. Yeah, and, I mean, it is advantageous. And they weren't impressed with me knowing 24 surahs at that point. They, yeah. they thought, oh, little kid, get out of here. Yeah. Th- that's the face they made. So it did turn out to be advantages to you. No, but I think what he's saying is I know people who do part-time, who memorize part-time since when they're younger, and it took them like six, seven years. Yeah. They're still pretty solid, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Do you think better? people at the age of 12, like, have grasped that? No. Of, like, memorizing the Quran, of, like, wanting to, like, this is something I really want to do. Do you think that's something that a 12-year-old can make a decision on? So, as you're asking me that question, I'm looking at the screen here with a cat. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you the metaphor of a cat. What does an owner know what a cat wants? What does a cat want? Right? Kids are like cats. You know, they're just all over the place. Do you really expect them to know what they want? Right? So, the thing is, is like, you know, if I was a parent, you know, who's going to send my kid there, I would really figure out, you know, take them there, see how it is, understand if this is something that I feel comfortable with. Yeah. Right? Um, Maybe a trial run? Not even a trial run. Just just visit it and just see like, oh, you know, how is, you know, what what's it like? What's the environment? You well, know? they always polish it up for parents and stuff whenever they're, whenever they're visiting and the, the parents never see the dark side of it. And that's why I think there needs to be some sort of accountability, you know, that, which is another point. And that is, you know, there, there has to be proper accountability that honestly, I don't think that anyone who has studied the dean is ever going to say that. Um, that hitting is an acceptable form of tarbiyah, a form of education, especially when it comes to the kitab Allah Azza wa Do you think there ever is, I mean, I have my own reservations about it. Do you think there's ever a time that's acceptable to hit a child that's memorizing the Quran or the studies under the age of 15? I don't think hitting is an acceptable form of discipline. I don't think, especially, especially, now someone might challenge me and say, well, you know, what about the hadith that says, command your kids to pray at seven and hit them at 10, right? Yeah. I mean, I have an entire article written on my webpage, um, you know, my, um, you know, about that, explaining the hadith. Um, but, you know, I think that in general, when it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do not find a single narration of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet ﷺ was hit or he hit his companions when they failed to memorize the Quran. <clears throat> Excuse me. This, this, this idea that, oh, this is good for you. That hitting is good for you. That this is going to give you discipline. I'm sorry. That is the most twisted form of using religion to justify abuse. That is the most twisted, disgusting thing because you basically make the kid thinking that it's okay to be abused. It's okay to be harassed. It's okay to be slapped. It's okay to be hit. Um, all in the name of it's going to be better for you. Programming. So let me ask you a question. Dean related to pain, when they grow up, they're going to do the same thing. Absolutely. And they, they believe sometimes that, hey, uh, you know, when you ask them, no, no, you know what, this is for their own good. They, It becomes like they're on some high horse and they're doing something pious. You know, they're, they're a part of some piety. We're doing this for the sake of Allah. We're hitting them for the sake of Allah, you know? You know, and, and, and I'll be honest with you. You know, that's one thing I've, I've, you know, 
and that's I guess that's a, another side point about the whole idea of this idea that you need to suffer in order to gain something in Islam. Yeah. That this I, this sick idea that you have to suffer in order to propitiate some sort of God up there that needs you to suffer and to see you groveling in pain down there for him to bestow mercy upon you, right? Um, and so I look. I think I think um, parents need to be aware of what what goes on in these schools, and I think they also need to do their due diligence and listen. If if there's no such thing as a kid has to memorize the Quran, it, look, even the Prophet Sallam took twenty three years, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala didn't just shove the whole wahi in him, you know, in one shot. You know, so that he could become the half of, no, 23 years of understanding, of applying, and you know, that, that aspect of understanding, applying tafsir, and how it relates to their, to their teenage years. I mean, trust me, if, if I could have a choice, I would say, if you're going to have them memorize Quran, do it early on, right? But during the teenage years, dude, that's a very turbulent time, and things really either click or they don't click. Yeah. Right, like early on, like five, six years old, kind of. Yeah, like you know, I've, you know, when I got married, I told my wife, I said, I think that it's fair, you know, inshallah, when I have kids, I, I would want my kids to memorize to, first of all, to have the understanding of the relationship between them and the Quran, right? Have a good, healthy relationship with the Quran, and number two, you know, have them memorize a certain small number, but then teach them how to memorize, teach them how to keep up with the Quran, and then after that, it's their decision. Yeah. It's really their choice, right? Teach, t forcing them to memorize Quran does not make them a better Muslim. Forcing them to memorize Quran does not protect them from shaitan, you know? Um, in fact, um, you know, if, if, if we don't, you know, if we have to be really careful about that. We, we actually push a lot. I mean, look, we all hear stories of kids who, who went to these schools and, you know, they have crisis, crises of faith later on in their life. I mean, I'm not exaggerating this. Right. You know? Yeah, you hear about like Hufaz in Chicago land that are like you know always getting high as a kite. You know, you you'll be they'll be, they'll be going to tire away and then they're lighting up a joint before, and that's what they you know, because there's, there's no connection to the actual like the essence of the Quran. It's just I just memorized some, some words for that. That's what it came to, comes down to, right? Well, it stems from a cultural misunderstanding of what success is the idea that um, religiosity and success is rooted in brute memory and brute memorization and the amassing of knowledge in and of itself is scholarship like some people you i mean this goes into the whole thing of like medina like you know you've got people out there who are very good at memorizing sacred texts of mutun which is great but that's at a very 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 fundamental level of learning to memorize you know and, and I hate to use the term Bloom's taxonomy, you know, but, you know, memorization is the lowest form of seeking knowledge or learning, right? I think, I think we could, we can, you know, do better by encouraging parents and kids, you know, to learn more about the Quran. And you might be like, well, how are they going to do it? Learn Arabic, you know, that's a good incentive for you. Learn Arabic, understand the Quran, um, you know, try to learn as much Arabic as you can, because the more Arabic you know, the more it makes sense when you're reading the Quran, that alladhi is the masculine form, so the verb that comes after has to start with a ya, not a ta, right? Those sort of things help people when they memorize Quran. But if they're just memorizing, oh, you know, whatever, you know, it's it, it is what it is. You know, they're just going to get whatever they're used to. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the, the point you made. A couple of points you made earlier in the, in 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 our conversation. Number one is that you, when you had, before you had went to the madrasa that you had memorized three juz and you listen, a lot of it was through listening, right? Yeah. So it's part of your reform ideas, um, kind of fine tuning the learning mode. Cause yeah. I, you know, even in American school, there's like, there's only, there's certain stand, we talk about standardization, but at the same time, like people learn different ways. Yeah. Like, like for example, the Mauritania, that's the, the whole lahu method. You write down yeah. on this tablet and you like just what? Re re repeat right Amr you'd probably know more about yeah. can speak a little bit about that um, some of your time there but um, but that might work for somebody and you know versus the audio like you're listening to something because you have a solid sound memory yeah you know so is that is that something you would, obviously you you would uh, 
factor in to any kind of reform? Well, that, like I said, that really goes back to the idea of we as we as we as communities need to hold higher standards of the teachers. And j- like I said, just because you are a Mulvi, a Sheikh, a Maulana, a Qari, whatever, just because you memorize the Quran, it doesn't mean you are a teacher of the Quran. Okay, and in say, and, and I say that without any regret because it's not an insult. It's saying, you know, you need to know your limitations, and that students learn in different ways. I have some students I've taught Islamic studies to studies to. They don't learn through lecturing. They learn through a hands-on activity. They learn through something that's indirect, and that stays with them. And I really think that, you know. The idea of just going to sit there with a pillow behind you on the, you know, the, the sheikh just sitting there just like listening, right? It's just like, that's just too easy. And I'm not being disrespectful. Yeah, you're not being condescending. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying, you know, you're going to have to put more work in, ya sheikh, ya, you know, molvi sab, you know, you're going to have to put more work than just sitting there and being like, this is gacha. You know, <laughs> you gotta become pakka. You, you know, you gotta become a fully pakka, right? So just go back and you know, like, how dare you? You know, followed by a slap or something. I mean, the job becomes too too easy, right? You got to know how to diversify um, learning for kids. Otherwise, but do you think, in in all fairness, that because uh, a lot of times the hafizab is put in that situation, he has to monitor like thirty kids at once, and he's looking around the room, he's trying to monitor them and listen to the person at once. You, I, I firmly believe there there needs to be a lot more teachers in that room, and you know personally, um, you know, like one 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 system in Egypt that I loved is that you have one teacher and you have. Uh, 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 five students around him and they used to do memorization of the Quran my a close friend of mine you know Sheikh Suhail Mullah I don't know if you guys know of him yeah. he, he lives in California yes. he introduced me to this whole new way of memorization on tariq al-sama meaning by way of listening where the teacher he reads three words and everyone repeats the three words yeah. he reads it three times like three words or like half of the line yeah. and they all he, they just listen to him three times and then all of them on their own have to do it three times without looking at the Quran the Quran's closed right now yeah the Quran is not open. And then he goes through the first and then he finishes the next three and then he does a whole line all at once. Yeah. Three times. And then they all do it from memory without looking at the Quran three times. Wow. And then they, he does a whole page or half a page and then when they're done for that day, if they're done, then they open it up and then they look at it after yeah. they memorize it just in a group with just listening. Right? Yeah. I thought that was awesome. It's very is, slow. Is, is it rhythmic? Yeah. Because uh, I've, I've uh, been taught that rhythmic style and it's not necessarily... Like, like on point with uh, with every the way you would hear the Quran normally being yeah, recited, well, but what, what, I know what you mean. What they do is well, one thing. What I've witnessed is, is that it's read very slow, very clear with like a, a good level of tajweed, right? Uh, very clear, very not trying to beautify too much, yeah. But kind of like a husari style, a minchawi yeah. style of reading. Right. And so it's very, very clear. And he'll look at the students and see which of them are like, wait, they didn't get that. And he'll repeat that again. So he's just looking at the students all the time. Yeah, I you think know? I encountered that once. And yeah. I found that very helpful. It's very beautiful. You're not memorizing big chunks, but it's 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 retained very well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's a lot more. It, it's, it, it's good because you have like 10 pillars. And with each pillar, maybe you have like three or four students, you know. Yeah. Uh, with each pillar is one teacher there. I thought that was really cool. I yeah. thought that was, you know, I thought that was, I would love to see that type incorporated. But see, the thing is that sometimes I think we're in a hurry and just mass producing sometimes yeah. that we got to get them in one year and then, you know, the revision another half a year or two years, you know, so. Well, part of the problem is, is like you, this boarding school style, right? Yeah. You're like, okay, I, I got to put this kid in and it's done by, well, I think a lot of it is, it's, so it's the greater issue is this issue of, Getting things done by a certain age. Yep. If you're not done with college by age 22, you're a failure. If you're not married by age 25, you're a failure. If you're not done with this by this age, yeah. right? And so this HIF, the, like this two year program, is like, I got to get this kid out of this program so I can put him into like high school, right? Yeah. Or middle school, whatever. Go back, back into full time school, right? Yeah. So I, th- I think that that's an issue there. But, but Chow, I wanted to ask about you mentioned a, a good point about like all your classmates at Madrasa. None of their parents were Hufad, right? Yeah. Now, like right now, for example, my my daughter is she's at, she, she's she's pretty much four before in a week. She's in her you know did one year of pre K where they did like ha, like about well, she memorized like fourteen surahs, right? So the whole two year program is like Josamba, right? And uh, the thing about it is, um, and and our, my wife and I we talked. He's like, listen, if that's something she 
is gravitating towards afterwards and wants to pursue more. I mean, she's only four or five years old, but if she likes it and she like wants to like, and you see, she's got like a knack for it and we'll, you know, we'll encourage yeah. it. Right. Nurture. It. Right. But at the same time, we're like, we're almost like, Hey, we're our parents. Um, we're, we're kind of looking from an ego. I don't know if it's the right way to look at it, but we're like, yeah, we want, it's, it's a good reason for us to memorize Quran as well. That's beautiful. To that like, you know, beautiful. to try to like do it with your kid. Um, so for parents who want to like, so so the, 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 they they got their kids in some kind of school, some program where they're doing hifs. What advice would you have for like parents of young children who are who also want to memorize, um, you know, on top of you know what they're doing? Is for as far as like what, what learning styles have you found efficient? Maybe for people because it may be it's they say it's good for it's easy for young kids because their brains are like you know what sponges, sponges right? Yeah. For us, it's like we've seen a lot of stuff. We've seen we've seen a lot of ish stuff or sins affect it. You know what I mean? So hmm. okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't think there's a one size fits all sort of a thing. I mean, it's it's really difficult. I, I look. Every parent knows their own child, and I look. I would say to a parent, don't rush. Let it come naturally. Um, you know, just just see what your kid is good at. You know, hey, look, if they have a knack for it, then encourage it. Don't force it. Encourage it. Um, and you know what? If they don't it, look, if they don't, if they don't feel like memorizing today because they, they're not feeling it, that's fine. You know, um, look, I, you know, I know you mentioned a few different methods. Like, okay, you know, you have the on tariq al you know, to listen, and you know, some other people say we got to teach them the tafsir. You know, there's look. I think there's a lot of different methods that we can incorporate. But like I, but one thing that I always want to emphasize is be involved in your child's memorization. Show a true interest. Show authentic, genuine care for what they're going through. Really know what what are they what are they memorizing. And you know what? It's not just the idea, oh, I'm just gonna drop you off at the school, you're gonna go memorize it and then, and then come back. You know, it's 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 that kind of that kind of parenting doesn't really work, especially for this. Now, listen, I always encourage parents, if you're gonna tell your kids to memorize Quran, I think every parent should should require themselves to make an effort to memorize the Quran as well. Yeah, I mean, is, is there any parent that gonna, that's going to be sitting there and saying, "No, I don't need to memorize the Quran"? Right. I mean, basically, they should have a pro. They should be involved in some kind of program I, in their locality where they're doing. Yeah. It, right? a, a lot of times with parents, we feel that hey, we're too old now, so we're going to have our children do what we couldn't do, which is very stressful on the child. But what one thing that one thing that I think was an awesome idea, and I, I'm a firm believer in this, is that the child, whether they do full time or, or I think they sh- if if they do if they do part time, and even on the weekends, it should be that the parents make it a goal that they listen to the child and the child listens to them. Yeah, because it's not a lot of memorizing. You know, um, if you really think about, it, I think memorizing three lines. One of my friends, uh, he calculated if you memorize three lines, which is out of the out of the mushaf that you get in Saudi, you would memorize in eight years. If you memorize three lines a day. You know, um, so if you could re- really memorize three lines a day with your child, the child listens to you. The Quran becomes interactive becomes a family thing now, Absolutely. right? And it's not like you don't have to feel guilty because you're being consistent. It's only three lines. It's not a lot. No, it's not. Yeah, right. Let's say you want to make it two lines, right? Add in a few, a few years to that. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. But but the thing is that uh, even if the child is doing it part time, the parent has to be the one listening to them, and the the parent should at least try. The child, I think, should see that. Hey, I as I want to memorize the Quran. At least they see me trying. You know what I'm saying? And then the child tests the parents too, and that just can you imagine what type of uh, a love that creates and what yeah. type of relationship? It's like, hey, I'm not on my own and memorizing this whole entire book. I no, I have no idea what it's saying. You know, they're not expecting me to have these huge expectations. I mean, they're doing it with me. And, you know, ch- I think kids will remember that forever, you know, that it becomes a, a way that we create bonds. And it's not just just to piggyback off of that. I don't really think that it's just simply limited to the idea of memorizing Quran, you know, your kid memorizing, you memorize. I think parents really need to make learning a, fami- a family affair. It doesn't have to be just memorizing Quran. Let's be honest. You know, I'm just going to say it. How many of these parents that send their kids to these schools, do they actually go take classes and learn about the deen? Do they? I mean, or, or not? Or, you know, do, do they do it? I'm pretty It's definitely sure. not the majority. Yeah. You know, so, so, so when, when you have a, a family where everyone is involved in a, in an element of seeking ilm, okay, uh, of learning, 
your kid sees that. They see that mom and dad go to the halaqas and learn and try to benefit and they have discussions about it. Sure, maybe they're, maybe they're not, you know, uh, so great at memorizing Quran, but the fact that they're still making effort to learn the deen, that has a very positive impact on the kid because they're seeing that, okay, memorizing Quran is not just memorizing Quran, it's talab al-ilm, it's, it's, it's seeking out knowledge. So whether you're seeking out knowledge in the form of Quran or halaqa, tafsir, hadith, you know, classes, it's about creating um, a sense of, 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 you know, of, not living a, 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 a false life, you know, expecting your kids to do it, but you don't do anything about it. Sure. Yeah. Chow, before we get into, I wanted to ask you about your master's, but is there anything else, anything else you want to comment on as far as like education reform or madrasa reform? Look, I, I think that it has to be a real national dialogue. Um, you know, I, honestly, I know ISNA does like the education forum every year. Um, look, I, I think that it's, it's, it's it's something it's a, it's I think it's going to be a huge effort but at the same time be, before standardization happens I can only say dear parents do your due diligence and know what your what your kid is learning whether it's in public school or homeschooling or madrasa whoever it is know what you're doing be an informed parent don't be a parent that just sort of exports the issue out to someone else and then let them let the Quran do the parenting and if I could piggyback off that, I I love that he said that don't export this to to, to to don't you know to 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 another institution. Parents have to be very very well equipped. So with this, I I want just our listeners to know we're not by any way being condescending to anybody who had memorized the Quran in the madrasa, or if you are in the madrasa right now. Um, we don't obviously we don't think we, you're actually gems of our society because you've memorized the Quran. Absolutely, it's nothing about that. We have yeah. it's we're not even saying that. We, I mean those those individuals that have to go through a day in day out. Even some individual takes them four years to memorize the Quran. You are the gems of our society. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about making the process an easier and a better process, especially in 2017. That's all we're saying. Yeah. We're not saying anything about the individuals themselves that are memorizing. Yeah. Even those individuals that are, are, are overseeing this and their oversight, we know it's not easy. This is very difficult. It has nothing to do with that. So if it came off that way, especially from me, you know, we're not, we, that's not our intention. Our intention is we want progress. That's all it is. You can always make things better. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. So like now you, at some point you went to Nashville, Tennessee and went to Vanderbilt for your master's in yeah. Christian theology. Yeah, uh, kind of like kind of <laughs> interesting. Uh, so the dean was you, so your background is kind of an Akida background in yep. Medina, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like you that was your your inclination was always about theology. Uh, you know what what about Christian theology st- struck you enough to make you want to actually pursue a degree in it? So here's what happened. You know, I'll be I'll be very honest. The idea of going to Medina and studying the dean, and you know what, I will always have a certain stigma attached to me because I studied in Medina, right? Whether it's good, whether it's a good, um, uh, you know, impression that people have or a neutral or even a negative. The thing is, is that I feel that a lot of people don't, um, don't appreciate the Dean enough until they go have something else to compare it to, right? Um, I did not appreciate my dean until I had to go looking around with other religions and then come back and realize, wow, Islam really does make sense, even though I don't really know a lot about it. But like I said, you know, it's it's something that you kind of take for granted. So after I came back from Medina, I taught in schools, I worked in Masajid, and I'll be really honest with you, I found it really tiring because the questions that I was getting from college students or from students are – so removed from the actual science itself of sharia or fiqh or hadith. In other words, I'm not saying it's not applicable. What I'm saying is you have to really be able to move away from, as I call it, intellectual vomiting, okay, and regurgitation of information into, I'm going to listen to what the issue you have, the question you have, and I'm going to try to relate to that from a Shara'i perspective. That takes a lot of skill, you know? Um, um, and so when I, when I went uh, and worked in these institutions, I felt like I couldn't answer some of these questions, right? Just 
answers on inter- interpretation, answers on why is the deen like this, why is the deen like that. Sure, I could have my own answers from the Quran and the Hadith, etc., and the tradition. But um, I just felt like in order for me to become a better da'i, I live in the United States of America. The predominant religion is Christianity. I need to know more about it. So, um, so I, so I, you know, applied to go to um, Vanderbilt, and it was it was also sort of a personal challenge for myself that, you know, this is a very different science. It's Christian theology, and you know, I went there, studied two years of it. Um, I will say this: the mindset that I get when I went there was was really about number one. You are going to their turf to understand their dean. You are not there to debate them. Okay. You are, and this is, this is, this is a very important aspect. You will learn what they tell you to. You might say, well, how do you know it's the truth? Or what if it's this denomination versus that denomination? It doesn't matter. It's about you are not there to prove them wrong. You are there just to listen and learn, right? So when I went there, I didn't have this idea that, you know, I'm going to be there to debate or I'm there, I'm to there de- on a mission. I'm there on a mission. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the arrogance, right? That, that you would think that you would go and debate people. And, and, you know, you find this in a lot Cause of the ruckus on campus. Yeah. Yeah, you find this a lot on social media right now where certain people, they think that that by being controversial and by by provoking, uh, you know, that, wow, that's, you know, this Allah Akbar kind of da'wah, right? This whole takbir kind of da'wah. And, and you know, and like I've had people that would ask me like, oh, so you say Christianity, Christian theology? Okay, so disprove Trinitarianism for me. I'm like, I'm not going to disprove Trinitarianism for you, okay? Because... If you need me to affirm, to help affirm your deen by deconstructing Trinitarianism, number one, that's very disrespectful. And, but number two, you are not appreciating your deen based on its own merit. You're doing it at the expense of another religion. Yeah. Right. So when I went there, I learned a lot, uh, you know, focused a lot on art as well, focused on literary theology, you know, fiction and writing, etc. And a great deal of history and theology in it. Um, and I, look, honestly, look, a lot of people think that, oh, I went in the deep end by learning Christianity. I will tell you that I have grown to appreciate Islam even more, oh. you know, not because at the expense of Christianity, but just – I really benefited from that kind of a setting where there is a roundtable discussion. I'll be honest with you. At Medina, there was not much roundtable discussion. Okay? The idea that – and a lot of people, they're afraid of roundtable discussion. It's lost in the Muslim world. It's lost. Discussion. Just sitting there and witnessing the professor – you know, have a script in front, a, a, a text in front of them. Everyone has to read it. You have to do a reflection paper. You have to, uh, you know, write something on it. And then you have to listen to other people. I, I will never forget this one incident, okay? To sum it up, I was in a discussion group one time. And we were talking about the necessity of why Christ is necessary for the salvation of mankind. Okay. And it was just a really, really long-winded discussion. Basically, the summary is when we sin, we can never repay God, and therefore we owe a debt to God. And since there's nothing in the world that could pay God, that we could repay God for, uh, for what we have done. But, you know, is there something more valuable than what you can give? Yes. Jesus Christ is more, more valuable. Therefore, Jesus is the redeemer now, right? So as a result, I stopped the entire discussion. I said, look, man, I said, you said that grace is, is when you sin, there is a, there is a, there's something that is owed to God, right? You owe God something. And there's this idea within Christianity where, you know, if Allah promises punishment, he has to take vengeance out or else God breaks his promise. Whereas in Islam, it's completely different. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises reward and salvation, Inna Allah la yukhlifu al-mi'ad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ever go back on his promises. That's always in the terms of, reward and justice and those sort of things. But when it comes to punishment, we as Muslims believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full right to rescind the threat of punishment. That he doesn't have to be this angry God that has to punish people. So I was in this discussion and I just simply said, you said that we owe God a debt now because of sin. I said, what about before sin? The gift of life, the gift of knowledge, the gift of sight. Isn't that also a debt owed to God? Prior to sin, but isn't that their? Wouldn't they say less original sin? 
Well, that's the original sin thing, right? It is because the idea of that now that Adam has sinned, therefore we can never repay it back, right? So I said before Adam even sinned, the gift of life given to Adam, right? Isn't that also a debt owed to God technically, even though we could never repay God? And I remember a guy in my classroom, he looked at me and there was a long table and the professor was sitting in the corner and he looked at me, he says, well, Chow, uh, we're not talking about your God here. Like, like he didn't just say that as, oh, like a light bulb moment. We're not talking about snap. And I wasn't talking about snap. I was just trying to engage him and say, debt is owed whether or not there is sin, because everything is given freely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was that moment that really made me think like, oh, well, you know, you do have jerks also in divinity school, right? So, you know. Was he, was he being condescending when he He was very that? condescending. Okay. And, and, you know, even the professor stood up and said, no, Chow's right. There, that is a good point that, you know, th- there is debt uh, owed to God, you know, even without sin. It's of that grace is freely given, as they say. Right? right. So, you know, so having those sort of moments of discussion, I think, really opens up a person's mind on what – what we take for granted, that we don't really have that discussion going on in our community, uh, you know, as much as we want it to be. So, um, it really, I mean, can you imagine, I had to go and do papers on tafsir of passages within the Bible, wow. right? I mean, it's a total different ball game compared to when you have to go write a paper on some ayat that you have to do tafsir on, right? It's a completely different ball, ball game that you have to go read and research the, 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 the Hebrew text and, you know, all these sort of things. It, it really gave me a greater appreciation. And to be honest with you, Christianity, as a lot of people think, oh, it's this and that among the Muslim community, I'm going to tell you they have a lot of scholarship as well. Of course they There's do. a lot of scholarship and we have to respect that, Yeah, you know. So I think it was a great experience. Because people don't know that the Bible, people have done what is considered a tafsir of the Bible. Even some Arabs, Arab Christians will refer refer to the explanation of ta'wil or yeah. tafsir of the Bible. Yeah. People don't know that though. So, I mean, I think that's, that's really an eye-opener for a lot of people. I do agree with your concept that like Muslims, I even catch myself in this, that we feel like we know enough about Christianity based upon like a Dr. Like Lawrence Brown lecture on YouTube yeah. or something. Or I know a lot of people man, back in the day, I was a part of those like, guys. Yeah, Maybe you listen to for one or two speeches. Like, man, I could go, to, I yeah, could go I, I debate could, all the Christians. I, I, I could go like take down a pastor. This pastor doesn't know squat. You yeah. hear something, you're like, you know, and maybe that specific pastor you can, but like, there's it's deeper than that. There's some people that. Well, I think the evangelicals have damaged that in that respect. They've they show very little scholarship from their end. They they have a lot of these mega stars who, uh, you know, are giving their their audiences very digestible messages. There's no very little nuance to anything and. And I think when outsiders see that, they're like, "Oh well, there must not be much scholarship." In, in would, would you agree with that assessment that it's that the scholarship is not within necessarily the evangelical preachers, the mega churches? I would look, uh, look. I I don't want to speak on behalf of Christian. Okay, I, I'm the last mm-hmm. person to say that to to ever make these assumptions. But I would say there are definitely. There is definitely scholarship within every denomination within yeah. Christianity. I mean, to to it's not because trust me, if you're going to talk about dogma, you know, dogma and being dogmatic, etc. I can tell you that many non-evangelical churches are pretty pretty darn dogmatic too in the way how they present it. As this is the only way how 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 Christology should be, or this is the only way how theology should be, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's appreciating that nuance. It's just like if we as Muslims would like non-Muslims to appreciate the nuance within our tradition, within our fiqh, I think we should at least give some uh, some respect, like, you know, not just simply just dismiss it. Um, and they'll be like, well, in the Quran, you know, Allah says this and this and that. See, the thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an didn't send the Qur'an specifically to address the Christians. It was meant to address the pagans, the Jews, the Christians, and the whole world. So, you know, what the Qur'an mentions about Christianity is a small portion of it. It's not going to mention everything out there. Exactly. Now, a lot of people will listen to the show and they might get intrigued by your study of Christian theology and it might strike a chord with them where they might find some interest. They want to pursue that course of study what prerequisites would you have for a muslim learn islam first like what does that mean like like you because you you got a four-year degree from an islamic university yeah 
Are we talking at that level or like at least an island program or what would you consider a, a, a baseline rec- requisite based knowledge? Okay. So I think for th- – that's a great question. I think for a lot of – I wouldn't say there is a level, a baseline per se. But what I would say is this. Any person that wants to study anything, and this is what I'm really passionate about, is they need to learn Anything, whether it's math, science, as long as it's Christianity, whatever it is, they have to learn it systematically. They have to learn it in a way that's logical. They have to not just simply just just learn stuff and you know, like you know, like Joe Bradford likes to call it checklist, checklist Islam. You know, like oh this 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 this. No, it's really having, as they say in Arabic, proper tasil ilmi, having proper foundation in how in like how often do we have amongst Masajid and in our Muslim institution, Islamic institutions, Islamic epistemology. How do we know what we know? I think a lot of the issues that we see on campus with young people is they don't know what they're knowing. It's just this is this is the fatwa. This is what we heard. They don't have proper understanding of how Islamic thought is brought to the forefront. So whenever they're confronted with an issue, an issue whether it's um, LGBTQ, or they're confronted with issues on politics. You have a wide spectrum of people on op- complete opposite ends, right? You have people that are like, no, it can't be, or yes, you have to, right? And it's, it's, you know why? Because they don't have proper ta'sid ilmi, proper building of the foundation of the science of Islam. And so, in that regard, I think for a lot of Muslims, we need to, I wouldn't say don't study it, but don't study Christianity f- on a whim that you are there to prove them wrong. Okay, so that I think that's the intention most people would come from, though. Like, yeah, what other like what your intention was like? Okay, I want to understand this religion. That's the majority yep. religion in, in my country. Yep. Yeah, and that's purely it for you because, like, to me, honestly, like I don't have a huge need to. But for me, it's like okay. For example, you you, you meet some evangelical somewhere not the stereotype all evangelical but some of them you know i've met some and you know and then you're like okay i need to have my ammo ready right yeah. just to like you know so that's like my honestly it's my intention is like if i'm ever it's, a, it's an issue of self-defense i i don't believe in going and instigating um debate just to tear someone's religion down yeah of course you know what i mean i, I don't I, I don't believe in that but if some if in this time that we live in if somebody comes up to me is like based and wants to you know challenge islam from that background or say that, you know, God guide me to Jesus, I want to have my self-defense ready. You understand? Yeah. Well, I think the operative word right there that you said is challenge Islam. And the thing is, is that if we as Muslims don't know enough foundational aspects about Islam, we are not on a footing there to sit there and be like, oh, okay, we're going to debate them on Christianity. So I would say, unless you're in for the long haul, unless you're which sort of is, was my goal to go into PhD. And then I realized, oh, the academic world right now is not good, not worth the, 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 the five years. And so, I mean, it's just that concept. It's not worth the poverty. It's not worth the poverty and it's a thankless career. Um, but hey, you know, if you're going to go in, you better make sure that you're doing it right. Because trust me, there are a lot of people right now, whether they're in divinity school, theological school, of any religion out there, you've got people out there who just jump from like some non-religious background and they're like, oh, we're just going to go and study Christianity now or we're going to study Islam. And you're like, wait, but did you have proper understanding of the basics before you before you jump in? So like what I would say, have proper understanding. I mean, obviously – like me. That's why I, I told my I, I'm sharing with you my story because it was just sort of the un it's the inevitable aspect that I got pushed into Hiv. I got you know, I was encouraged more or less to go to Medina. And I I come to appreciate it because I could have chosen another religion when I was in my teenage years, but I realized look, I need to understand my religion better. Now there's one problem though with all this is that <laughs> yeah. we have a f- Factories and factories of these people, as we alluded to earlier in the show, just being pumped out consistently. And they're coming to this country still with that kind of mentality of, of teaching. And I mean, where do we and how do we approach this problem? I mean, this has to come from like we don't have a Vatican where, you know, that there's like 
somebody who comes and says like, hey, you guys are doing this all wrong. How do we communicate this if you throughout the Muslim the world? Country. So first we did expand the Muslim ban. The Muslim ban is not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know, right? <laughs> okay, but Cha, what are your thoughts? Look, I, <laughs> I look, I, I didn't want to bring up Trump, okay? And look, I think at the end of the day, you're always going to have people that are going to emigrate to this country for whatever reason it is, you know, for, uh, you know, for better life. And, you know, I think everyone has a right to move to wherever they want to have better, which is fine. But I think the, 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 we can never put a stop to that. And it's not ethical either. But what we can do is to, we as American Muslims really need to take the forefront of this idea of we need to stop letting other people appoint leaders for us. We need to stop this idea. We're just going to take the back seat on our community and on our learning. Because if you do that, you're basically allowing someone else to dictate that. And that's why I'm always a big proponent of, listen, part of the reason why I left teaching and imam positions was because you don't find enough people that really, really want to support grassroots growth. If we as communities really supported people who studied, not just studied, but just went and studied other things as well and encouraged them to take up positions within our community, I think naturally that's going to self-filter out these other forms of learning that are either outdated or not yeah, relevant. I mean, I mean, but yeah, we can solve it in, in America, but I'm, I'm talking... In You're the, in the world, in the, in, in, on an international, I mean, it was great that we would be able to put an end to that in this country, and that, that wouldn't be that hard, uh, at least relatively but, yeah, compared relatively to the international compared, world. Yeah. yeah. So I internationally, like, because these guys are not just they're, they're poisoning their, their country, their, their countrymen. I know uh, someone who is uh, a, a, a close friend of mine who you know who, who apostated, and he, yeah. he 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 said that when he was in Pakistan. He would ask questions about the religion, and they said they would smack him and say, "Who's your dad? Why are you asking these questions?" You know, and and just because he didn't have the answer to his questions regarding theology, um, he ended up leaving. And now he he tells me about like, man, I, I have no interest in learning. You know, what you say makes sense, but I feel like I I live my life uh, fine without it. So. I mean, look, on a, look, this, you bring up a really good point here. And look, I, I will, I will, you know, I want to cite, there's a hadith out there. This idea of people seeking out the truth, sorry, you know, seeking out the truth and then getting a terrible response and being rejected to their face, it's something that's going to happen. And it actually is going to be a, I think it's going to happen until the end of time. We can't really stop it. I mean, you look in the hadith of the Prophet. That famous hadith of that, that man who had killed 100. We all know this hadith. But the idea that when he first went and asked if there was salvation, if there was redemption for him, what is the first answer that he got? It's just in the same grain. You're not going to be forgiven. You're too evil. You've killed too many people. It's the same thing. This idea of shutting down discussion, shutting down difference of opinion, not accepting nuance, right? And a lot of people don't appreciate that. They think they're, they're on extremes of, oh, okay, well, nuance basically means, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a difference of opinion every day. There's a running joke about that. There was a guy, that's a running joke. You know, whenever he was asked, you know, you know, you know, how many aqwal, how many opinions are this? There's always two opinions, right? Until someone says, afillahi shak. You know, is there a doubt in the existence of God? And he was like, maybe there's two opinions on that, you know? And so the idea is, is that, that man got that horrible response where he said, you have no redemption. So this is – the Prophet ﷺ already taught us about this, that, yeah. that, that, that you're going to find people that are going to be jerks. They're going to be rude. They're going to give you a cheap response, rude. But you know what? What I'm going to say right now sounds really, really like easy, but I firmly believe, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorts things out. And I'm not saying it like, oh, yeah, you know, Allah's going to take care of it. What I mean is, is like a person who's put in that position of being asked that, 
They're rendering themselves irrelevant. And a person who goes and seeks that answer and gets that kind of answer, okay, and is shocked from that kind of answer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ab- abandon them and then neglect them and just be like, oh, okay, whatever. That person is going to c- continue looking. Yeah. You know, they will look. They're not just going to be like, okay, well, I just got slapped down. Keep moving. <laughs> Bam. Yeah. That, that uh, is thank you, right man. on the money. Thank you. Yeah. That's, right money. that's real talk. Yeah. So, uh, Chad, what's, so you're working in IT. You taught yourself some technical stuff and got into oil and gas industry because we talked about, we told this before that Islamic uh, institutions just don't pay in America <laughs> uh, unless you become a celebrity mom circuit and collect $10,000 for honorariums, <laughs> which I sense you're not doing. Well, you know, <laughs> look, I, I, speaking about that, I mean, I, look. I think the main issue is a lot of imams and students of knowledge, They, they if you ask them what is the one thing that they crave for, they want autonomy. They want, you know, in the academic world, you have something called being tenured. The idea of having the license to not fear to say what it needs to be said. And I think a lot of imams and students of knowledge are stifled in saying what is correct in the name of communal, you know, just in the name of just not getting fired, right? They just don't want to get fired. Um, so, going to IT was sort of a, a a different transition. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I have a great boss who, <laughs> who taught me a lot, you know. So, I work in the IT field for oil and gas industry, in the oil and gas industry. Um, it's great. You know, do I find it fulfilling? Like, yay, I, you know. The exciting life of IT. <laughs> Troubleshooting and answering tickets. <laughs> Hello, how can I help you? This doesn't work. What, what doesn't work? Can you please share screen? Can you please grab control over link, please? Just give me control of the screen right now. No, no, but this doesn't work. Okay, what doesn't work? Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. Just give me step by step. And you know, to be honest with you, it's, it's okay. Because, you know, working in IT, you really are forced to think thematically uh, 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 in a uh, in a proper methodology like yeah. go through the steps are you in, in are you in infrastructure or no i'm in content server okay. so so document control and those sort of things okay. right exactly life of document control yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I always i'm in it and i don't even know what that is so, so sims in it um and I always tell like Sim, like I don't know how you like haven't shot yourself in the face yet by working on IT because <laughs> no, it's IT actually, sounds like the most boring. No, it's job. actually the perfect one for a, people with ADD because you're getting different types of tickets and oh, okay. you're, you're looking at problems in different ways. So when you get stuck on a problem, you just don't sit on it. You move on to another ticket and solve. Google. You know, get the the low hanging fruit and. And then you come back to the hard ones. wins to get the KPIs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is KPIs that were? Key, Key performance, performance indicators. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we corporate guys know now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's maybe, it's maybe that's something the Islamic institutions should implement. KPIs? Oh, yeah. yeah. Best yeah. practice of KPIs, yeah, for sure. I think they should. Yeah, so or what do you think in like long term? Do you think in, you know, because you mentioned the PhD was of interest, but of course the reality is it doesn't pay, it's thankless. You know. Look, I, I respect anyone who goes down the academic route. Um, uh, you know, um, for me, it's just sort of like, unfortunately, it is what it is. You know, it doesn't pay very well. And I know even if I did have a PhD right now, I'm going to go do IT again after it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you know, but hey, you know, what if I was in the IT department at a university, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing. It's, 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 I, I'm at a, I, I'm at a place in my life where I accept, where I've accepted that, where I'm, just, I'm just like at a point where, hey, you know, um, the, the scholars of the past, they didn't have, um, they didn't fully dedicate themselves just to reading books alone. They all had some sort of other, you know, form of income that they would, you know, for example, Sheikh Al-Bani, rahimahullah, he was, he was, he was a, a, a watch or clock fixer, right? He would fix clocks and stuff and he would have his own business, right? Um, you know, uh, so I just think it's, it's, it actually, empowers you more when you have uh, you're multi you know multitasking understanding the dean being able to work in IT which really isn't a goal but you know but is <laughs> but hey you know if if you really like IT you know sure go right ahead you know while you're at it go into networking you know cuz everyone <laughs> out there is doing networking yeah. or everyone out there is just busy configuring servers you know oh oh how exciting is that yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, it's my job. Yeah, I, 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 know, I know we had talked about uh, you have a you made it feel bad, bro. Yeah. <laughs> hey, at least we're in the same field. <laughs> Before we wrap up here, uh, I, I mentioned the, the original like reference at the end of the show about like uh, Asian people and pork and all their food, right? Because it came up because I'll, I'll tell you. I, I apologize again. <laughs> this, yeah. this might be like what you call cult, like cultural appropriation or whatever it is. But like, um, so I have a, a coworker. A friend of mine actually told me about his coworker. He works in consulting, who says like he's and he's, he's Chinese. Like there is no meal without pork, right? Sure. Another story is I know a guy who like was on some project in Hong Kong somewhere, and he's like he was looking for so anything. He's a Muslim guy. He's got this vegetable soup, right? Until one day he happens to notice because I guess there was some kind of the kitchen was pretty close. He sees the guy open the lid and there's like a pig's head floating. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> you know, so you talk about halal chai. And if I understand, you're like if you used to rule high school, you're of the al kitab or the non the uh, right. You know, more or less. Sure. I, I just put your business out there. Yeah. So sure. like, but why halal Chinese food? Do you think like? Like Chinese food in general in America, I know Sim and I talk about this a lot. It's like, yeah, we wouldn't like, even though you might be non Z, you probably shouldn't go to a Chinese restaurant because they're probably using pork in there or something, right? Is that what sound of Sim you got? You're pretty strong. Yeah, that, that's just my sorry guess. So is that where you're coming from? You're like the Chinese food. There's no like even the non Z Chinese food is straight up haram in well, America. Here, here's what I so here's so, so here's what's happened. Okay, yeah. so. For a very, very long time, I, I've, you know, I've learned how to cook for my mother and um, she cooks great food and she puts a lot of dedication into her food. Um, and I've always appreciated that. And, you know, living in Medina, when you're so far away from fam- family, you end up forcing yourself to cook because it's just so much more enjoyable and you can relive certain moments, etc. So... I sort of had to force myself to cook. Now, what happened is, is, is that, I'll be honest with you, you come back to America, you see how Chinese food is in this country. It's an absolute abomination. It's like, it's like, like if there were a list of kaba'ir in culinary sciences, <laughs> Chinese food would be among the top of the kaba'ir of all kaba'ir, right? Because it is just a bastardization and an abomination of food upon food. You know that we're just going to put some duck sauce or some red sauce or some white sauce, you know, whatever those mean, right? And we're just going to pour some sweet concoction over your food and that's now – you know, cynicized, you know, um, or as lay people say, Chineseified, right? So, so, so the thing is, like, for me, I found it really frustrating that, you know, that if I wanted Chinese food in America, that I would have to go to some gross restaurant where General Tso's, who, Allah, if that's even a real person, um, or, you know, everything is just like sweet and sour. And, you know, obviously, I will appropriate this for myself. Dear scholars and students of knowledge, stop talking about fortune cookies, whether it's halal or haram or shirk, until you talk to me, because I'm Chinese, okay? And the thing is, is like, I just felt it really annoying. That food in America, the way how Chinese food is made is just really not proper, but worse. And not making fun of anyone. When you have other cultures making halal Chinese food, it's like... (laughs) <laughs> what is this? How is this Chinese food? Do I see elechi in there? Because we don't use that in our in our in our cooking. Wait, what is that? Do I see some masala in that chicken? We don't use masala in our chicken. So it's just like, you know, in Houston we have some of these, and it's just like, dude, this is like, you know. Sin upon sin now. You know, it's just, not just like indulging in the kebab, but indulging it in multiple times. You know, doing it over and over again, where it's just now they have completely destroyed Chinese food. So, so out of, out of that, you know, and also just wanting to preserve my mother's, um, you know, cooking and just really, really, you know, appreciate that. I've started, you know, an Instagram account, a Facebook page, you know, real light and small, where I would try to present Chinese food 
for the Muslim audience. And that's what I would like to do in the future one day, you know, have a cookbook and, you know, you know, these sort of things and really introduce Muslims to what really Chinese food is. You know, if you look yesterday, I was at a Korean restaurant, you know, with my in-laws, my wife, you know, and a friend. And, and I, and I remember I watched a show on YouTube about Korean food in the United States of America. And one thing they will say to you is before Korean food got big in this country, the thing why it stayed Korean is because Koreans did not settle on allowing their food to be modified. This is what you're going to eat. You know, you might not like the fish sauce, but this is what it likes. This is what it is. And I think that we need to bring that back to the Muslim community of what food actually tastes like. So, you know, I try to introduce them, you know, I'll I'll cook some food up. Um, And it's like, when you say halal Chinese food, are you talking about like specific regions in China where Muslims are? Not necessarily. It's just Getting Muslims educated about going to the supermarket. What are these ingredients? What can you buy? You know, as opposed to, oh, you know, hot sauce or sriracha. You know, there, it's more than that, right? Um, so that's that's my new thing. You know, hopefully, sometime down the line, I want to start posting recipes and and you know have have like a a book one day where I can publish it and really just you know market it to Muslims. And be like, hey, if you guys want to eat Chinese food without making without committing a kibira. Right here is the way out. Here's the here's the proper Chinese way. I see. So, but what if somebody still wants to eat Chinese food like in America? Do you think they should, based upon like what we talked about as far as like cross contamination, or just like using pork for like pork? It's like fried rice, but there's pork in it or something. I think it's I think it's with any restaurant, right? Whether you whether it's Chinese food or American food, I'll be honest with you, you know. And since you talked about the issue about zabiha and non z whatever it is, no person who is a non z individual can ever deny that when you have a surface where people just cooked bacon on it with the oil, that your food that's on that oil right now is halal. Like you cannot weasel your way out of that. You cannot, you know, just pretend that doesn't exist. That, that, that khanzir, suar, fat, whatever it is. Okay. (laughs) Of the porcine persuasion. Okay. You know, the, you, know, you know, the fact that, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you can be non <laughs> yeah, yeah, suar, you know? <laughs> suar hey, he doesn't in mean order. sewage. He means a pig in order to. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, it's like, like, you know, you, you know, you, you need to do your due diligence, whether you're eating at IHOP or whether you're eating at yeah. Denny's or Bex Prime or whatever it is. Right. So it's not. And no, if you are Z, the, the safest is to go to a Muslim restaurant. Just you eat at your own home. Yeah. That, that's the best thing to do, obviously. But if you want to be a little social, it's the easiest thing to do yeah. is to eat at a Muslim restaurant, obviously. Yeah. But I will say this. I don't know how it happens, but Muslims who are Zabiha, with all due respect and love for them, but dear brothers and sisters, if you are Zabiha, please don't find the first restaurant that's outside of your culture that is Zabiha and then over glorify them. Yeah. Like, for example, in Houston, we have a restaurant. I won't say which one. There's like, they serve burgers, right? Hala. And you have people who are Z. They've never had proper burgers. They go there and they're like, MashaAllah, Allah Baq. Allah Baq, Barbar Digari, Allah Baq. You know? Like, like Allah, what is this? Like, this is the best burger on earth. And it's like, First and foremost, you just described the burger like as if Jibril brought it down from Firdaus al Ala on the Ma'idah min as Sama on the same dining table that was brought down uh, for Isa alayhi salatu salam, and then he faced the Qibla and slaughtered the meat and blessed it with Zemzem. Like, seriously? Like, <laughs> your, your, your scope of knowledge is so limited. It's like, oh, you poor bichara thing. You poor thing. Like, you know what? If that's what makes you happy that you think that's the best, Burger on Earth, it's fadla. You know, go ahead. No, no problem. But you know, I used to be Zabiha, and I'm not anymore. But look, Chinese restaurants are pretty darn. They're not very clean. Um, so it's just the way how they handle food in general. I'm talking about regular Chinese restaurants that they don't handle the food very clean. You know, and and even in China and in Chinese circles, whenever you say the word. Qingzhen, which is the equivalent of halal in Chinese, which literally means pure and clean, right? There is a understanding in Chinese circles that it's clean. Like, wow, you want clean food where you won't get diarrhea and dysentery, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. where you don't get, you know, uh, sick and food poisoning, you go to a halal restaurant. 
right? It's within that culture. And I think um, we, um, you know, if you want to go eat at some general toes, you know, go ahead. But remember, they use MSG a lot. And, you know, that umami taste, that yeah. nice sixth sense, whatever. I don't know how many senses we have yeah. on our tongue, whatever. Um, but, you know. It's coming from pork? Well, I've heard that pork is that that creamy, that soft taste is that sixth or whatever. It's that umami taste. It's yeah. it's that nice taste that people want. So, you know, I mean, if your friend wants to eat pork and that's what's stopping him from being Muslim, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is not a fatwa. But let's 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 balance it out right now. Um, entering Islam but eating pork versus not entering Islam but not eating pork. Uh, I think you should still enter Islam. Of course, <laughs> of course. No, I agree with you. Of course, you know. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then you got like I'll leave with this. Like you, you got you got the extreme left wing of the Nazi crowd that you you order like I don't know chicken fried steak with country gravy, and right. they say like. If there's sausage, oh, it's probably beef sausage or turkey <laughs> sausage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, How? <laughs> you know, so, no, yeah. That's that's just some people who don't want to let you know you that don't. they don't they don't care. It's like I need GAF. Like, yeah. I call that pepperoni slab, pepperoni pizza slab, <laughs> where they just rip the pepperoni off. They're like, inshallah, that that shiny liquid there. That's not the ba- that's not the fat yeah. from the pork. That's from the cheese. That's from the cheese. <laughs> that's from the cheese. You know, Allah wants it easy for you, right? <laughs> With that note, uh, Chow, how, how can people – so uh, we, we are established that you do not accept friend requests on Facebook unless you know them personally from the <laughs> beginning, right? Same policy applies as 10 years ago? To it, So I'm very selfish on that regard. If you get friended by me, it's because I need something from you. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay, so I do apologize in advance. And plus, you, you don't use your re- – sometimes you don't use your real name on Facebook. Yeah, so like, it's, I, I was like, who is this dude? Like, how, how am I friends with him? So He's it, like, oh, that's Chow. It, it's failed miserably because I one time wrote my name in Telugu, okay? <laughs> I just went on Google Translate. What is it, with you, and, bro? Think, and then you know what? Telugu. My Hyderabadi friends were like, we know it's you because we can read it, Dumbo. And I was like oh, – Damn, like, man, I was trying to throw people off, but it doesn't work, right? So, um, if anyone wants to, like, engage, you know, me in, in, in this matter, they can always go to my Facebook page, um, you know, uh, Abdurrahman Chao, A-B-D-O-R-H-M-A-N-T-H-A-O. Um, and, or they could, you know, go to my website, archow.net. Um, archow.net. Yeah. And you have research under the research you were talking about. And- so I've written actually five posts. Like about two years ago, I wrote a five part series on, on memorize. Like these are the top issues that parents who want their kids to memorize Quran that they need to, to know about. Right. So I wrote a series on that. Um, I also write other stuff pertaining to education. Uh, so I haven't really wrote much on that site recently. Um, I guess. You know, just life comes around. But inshallah, I'll be writing more stuff on that. Um, yeah, but they can reach me on Facebook. They can reach me on um, on my webpage. As well as if they want to follow uh, my Instagram account, you know, Halal Chinese Food, they can find that as well. It's just Halal Chinese Food. Yeah, right? Halal Chinese Food. Halal with one A. Yeah, A-K-A. not Halal. You know, that, yeah. yeah, because, you know, people that do that, they're not, that. they don't. I mean, you didn't go to Medina, Halal. right? So we think maybe double A. Double A. Well, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> then you just start realizing. Only selfies got that joke. Yeah. yeah. PDFs, right? <laughs> PDFs, double A's. They all have PhDs and PDFs. <laughs> all right. Just like, like, we have and then double O's with the Sufis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just, just. Double E's, double O's. All right. It is like one thirty in the morning here. So we, right. we, we, we're at about two hours. Yeah, man. All right, uh, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Abdul. And we got to apologize to Sheikh Hasib Noor also. Yeah, if you heard for any some sn- reason, if you heard any snoring, it was uh, Sheikh Hasib Noor in the oh background. Oh my God, don't say that. We said we nobody knows he's in the hotel room. We're just gonna be sorry. Then. That's he's actually pacing the room right now. He's like, what can we? I want to go home and go to bed. He he, he doesn't know that. He, I got a text that Yasser Qadi wants to meet him right now. All right. <laughs> 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 I love this Megan. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. All right. right. With that one on that, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Abdul Chow. Uh, hey, thanks, man. If there's any uh, thanks for coming through, and we, I'll always a pleasure to, to no. This is awesome. Time I, honestly, with you. Awesome. Oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you for uh, you know enlightening this. It's company podcast with us. That, like these kind of podcasts, they always like we laugh a lot. Yeah, but it's having it's a good time. Good time. Yeah. You know, good and, and I was texting with Joe uh, while we were talking. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were laughing about Hasib sleep. Well, well, here's the thing, man. <laughs> you, you know, Irta it, Hassan was on our show. He's our first Houston guy. Okay. I don't know if you consider yourself a Houston guy or not. You just live there now, but. 
he was like, he would recommend, he always like hyping, like, you got to get Chow on. I was, I knew you before, right? I was like, yeah, I could see that. But I was still like, you know, he's got, this, I don't know if his sense of humor will come across on the show, but I think he did. Oh, yeah, I think yeah, he yeah. will. It's beautiful. It's dry. Beautiful. It's yeah. a dry. No, 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 we got it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone got it. So if he <laughs> bursts on, 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 on that note, before uh, Hasim jumps out the window, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at themadmumalukes at gmail.com. You can also like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Um, and for our co host, Sheikh Amr Said and Sim, this is Mahin signing off for the Mad Mamluks. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.